Hi guys and girls, so today I'm going to be looking at specific phobias and the various factors that lead to phobias and also the interventions associated with them. Uh, I've done a couple of videos on these so you may want to look at those as well, specifically, specifically as it relates to the 4P fact model and the biopsychosocial. So you first need to be able to tell the difference between stress, anxiety and phobias. So when you're going through these, you need to remember that stress is a state of physiological and psychological arousal produced by stresses. And we went through this when we were looking at stress. And you need to make sure that you write that it's perceived as challenging and possibly exceeding your ability to cope. Anxiety is a state of physiological arousal associated with feelings of worry and apprehension that something is wrong or that something unpleasant is it, uh, will occur. A phobia is excessive fear of a particular object or situation and you do need to add um, that interferes with daily functioning. So this is pretty much the way of looking at it. You may want to pause the video and screenshot this and put this into your notes as it's quite helpful. So once again, like mental illness, specific phobias are measured on a continuum and you would see if you had a phobia that you would be in the mental disorder category. And stress and anxiety, depending on how well you're managing it, you will be in this section here. Now, the phobia, as long as you are in the mental disorder category, you're going to be right if you're asked to put it on a continuum. And this is because a phobia is a diagnosable disorder. So we're going to be looking at the factors that contribute to a phobia. When they say... Um, the type of phobia, they're not asking for you to give the exact uh, Latin name for it. They're actually asking you to give the word specific phobia. So in VC psychology, according to the VCAR study design, we're only looking at specific phobias. You'll never have to actually mention, you know, a fear of heights or, you know, a fear of spiders is arachnophobia. You'll never have to do that. But you do need to say, if they say uh, what is the type of phobia, you say specific phobia. And it is characterised by significant fear of a certain object or situation that interferes with daily functioning. So the biological factors associated with um, phobias is GABA dysfunction. And gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, which is what we learned about in uh, Unit 3. If you have low levels of GABA in the brain, then the activation of the postsynaptic neurons can spread quickly. So in other words, um, the neurons are passing messages way too quickly. Because of that, it causes anxiety because just think about it, right? You're overthinking things and you're thinking very quickly about jumping to the worst conclusions every single time. So GABA dysfunction refers to low levels of GABA in the brain and it's been shown that people with specific phobia are more likely to have um, low levels of GABA than people without a specific phobia. Due to low levels of GABA, the flight, fight, freeze response may also be activated more easily. So that's the stress response. So once again, the stress response. So when there is perceived threat, so the phobic stimulus, let's say, for example, a spider. Uh, the fight, fight, freeze response is activated. Heart and breathing rate increase, uh, blood is redirected away from non-essential areas, and hormones such as adrenaline and are released into the bloodstream. This can be an issue when there is no real threat. For example, if you happen to be afraid of a spider, but you're only thinking about the spider, and the fight, fight, freeze response is activated anyway, then it's going to cause problems because all of this, you've got this stress response and it's just being set off for no real threat. Um, the stress response can then increase levels of anxiety and panic and make the phobia worse. Long-term potentiation. So you remember from Unit 3, once again, it is the strengthening of synaptic connections. So specific phobias can be learnt and therefore, long-term potentiation can strengthen the association between a phobic stimulus and a fear response. 
The more the connection is used, the more it will be strengthened and so on. It is likely that long-term potentiation is occurring within the amygdala as well as other structures because of the key role it plays in fear. Psychological factors. Uh, so the behavioural models tend to look at um, the classical and operant conditioning. So this is a question that gets asked a lot in the exam. Uh, classical conditioning um, of a phobia is precipitated by classical conditioning and perpetuated by operant conditioning. So it's brought on by classical conditioning and maintained by operant. So classical conditioning can lead to the acquisition of phobias. So you can acquire a phobia, you can get a phobia. This happens via the normal process of classical conditioning. Whereas neutral stimulus becomes a condition response to which the condition response is fear. So for example, you're attacked by a dog, it bites you and it hurts you. So you see S pain plus NS dog equals the CR fear of the CS dog. So you need to remember that classical conditioning can lead to a phobia, but operant conditioning can be maintain the phobia. So for example, after you're attacked by the dog, you avoid dogs completely. This reduces fears um, and anxiety, and therefore the behavior of the, avoiding the dogs is negatively reinforced. You continue to avoid dogs and you continue to have a phobia of dogs. Now, in regards to VCAR, and I'm actually going to put a little star here, terrible star, but you get my drift. I, this is something that comes up a lot in exams and a lot of people get this question wrong. So classical conditioning leads to the acquisition of a phobia, but it is perpetuated, so maintained through operant conditioning. And the question that's usually asked about this one is the fact that negative reinforcement. So if you're avoiding um, the dogs or you're avoiding the spiders, you get somebody else to kill them, uh, the spiders, not the dogs, right? It means that you're not facing the fear. And because you're not facing the fear, your avoidance is actually negatively reinforced because you're removing something that is unpleasant. And this means that you continue to have a phobia of dogs because you're not facing your fear. I would strongly recommend that you go over this section a couple of times um, and try to create examples for yourself. All right. Psychological factors continued. You've got cognitive bias. And this is where you tend to think in an incorrect way, which can affect your judgment and your decision making. Cognitive bias can make someone more likely to uh, feel fear or anxiety in response to a phobic stimulus. So we'll look at two particular types of cognitive bias, so catastrophic thinking and memory bias. So catastrophic thinking involves exaggerating an object or situation and predicting the worst possible outcome. So you're thinking of the worst possible thing. Um, let's go with a COVID vaccine thing, right? There is the worst possible scenario. You get stabbed by it and you're going to die if you take it. Or the needle's going to hit your bone and you're going to die. Um, you're going to get bitten by a spider and you're going to die, right? So catastrophic thinking is thinking the worst possible um, scenario ever associated with it. If I smell this flower, I'll get um, hay fever and then I'll sneeze so much, I'll die. And it's like the worst possible way of thinking about things because you always think about the worst case and it maintains the phobia. Memory bias is the second one. And this is where you're having negative or unpleasant memories about the phobic stimulus being remembered more strongly than other memories. So let's say, for example, if you have a phobia of dogs, you might remember the one time a dog chased you and not remembering the thousands of other times a dog didn't chase you. Um, so this is really important. Same sort of thing with a spider. You might actually only remember the time that the spider um, bit you or... Um, crawled on you, but not all the other times. The social factors. So specific environmental triggers, 
would be a negative or traumatic experience that you've had with a phobic stimulus. So, for example, if you happen to be chased or bitten by a large dog, bitten by a spider, the more severe the trauma, the more likely that a phobia will develop. So the more pain that you've experienced, the more likely you're going to fear it and it's just going to get on. Generally, people who develop a phobia after a particular experience are able to identify that experience as causing their phobia. They can actually pinpoint, this is when I started to fear this particular thing. There's also the stigma around seeking treatment. A lot of people, specifically with phobias, are afraid to seek treatment because they're afraid that they will be stigmatised, which means that they're afraid that they're going to be laughed at, they're going to be ridiculed or taunted because, oh, why are you afraid of a flower? Why are you afraid of a cloud? Why are you afraid of buttons? And these things exist, right? And it is excessive and it is irrational. And that's why people are afraid to seek treatment because they know that it's excessive and it actually causes them um, to be stigmatised because they know that they'll be laughed at and or they they think that they'll be laughed at um, and people don't quite understand so they don't seek help they don't ask for help because they know that people will laugh at them so recap just so we're clear um, these are all the different features you may want to pause and put this into your notes it's up to you now once again the phobia table that has the 4P factor model, and we all know that the fourth one is the protective factors, right? This is different to the one for mental health. You need to have different ones and you need to remember them. Unfortunately, a lot of people forget this. So make sure that you know that this is for phobias, the other one is for mental health. All right, so the interventions that are used to actually treat phobias. So I've seen this question a couple of times in regards to what are the evidence-based interventions. This is just the treatments that have been proven to be effective. That's all it is. So people get so confused and get so worried about the term evidence-based interventions. All it's asking is, what treatments have shown to be effective? That is it. That's all it is. So don't get too freaked out about that one. The biological interventions is benzodiazepines. Fun to say. So benzodiazepines are a group of uh, drugs that act on GABA receptors to re increase GABA's inhibitory effects. They reduce the activation of the postsynaptic neurons. So they're actually slowing down the nervous system so, so it's used to combat GABA dysfunction because of low levels of GABA and they relieve the symptoms of anxiety by reducing arousal levels however they do induce drowsiness they are highly addictive and they shouldn't be used long term you also need to remember that if you're going to take benzodiazepines right it's only treating the symptoms. It's not actually treating the phobia itself. So benzodiazepines need to be used in conjunction with a psychological treatment. So other um, treatments could also, and these are the biological ones, could include relaxation technique, such as breathing retraining, because a lot of people, when you're freaking out about something, when you're panicked and you got anxious about something, you tend to over-breathe. And when you over-breathe, you start to panic, right? And Because it leads to dizziness, lightheadedness, and blurred vision. So it actually, the psychologist would actually teach you how to breathe correctly and what to do in specific situations. Um, exercise can also be helpful because it promotes relaxation and then reduces anxiety. It can provide a distraction from the phobic stimulus. It can reduce the stress caused by a phobia because you're using up that energy and the hormones like adrenaline, all that sort of stuff to actually um, run or I don't know, whatever you do. It does promote feelings of well-being. If you feel, okay, I've been exercising, I feel good about myself. Therefore, you're going to be more 
um, you know, self-confident and your esteem will go up. Increased tolerance to anxiety and fear symptoms because you're, you know, using that, uh, that energy. Psychological interventions. When in doubt, CBT. So CBT aims to change thoughts, behaviours that contribute to the progression and continuation of the phobia. And CBT aims to change thoughts that the phobic stimulus is extremely unpleasant or dangerous. So essentially they're changing negative thoughts into more positive ones. So essentially if you have a fear of dogs, it'll say, okay, why do you have a fear of uh, dogs? Explain that to me. Okay. Um, let's change the negative feelings to more positive ones. What is What are the good things you think about dogs? And it reduces avoidance behaviours, um, which we've learnt before is a negative reinforcement. Uh, it may also incorporate relaxation techniques such as breathing retraining and exercise. So you don't just use one of these treatments, you use a combination of all of them. Systematic desensitisation is the most commonly used type of disorder, oh, sorry, of intervention to treat uh, phobias. And this is what uses graduated exposure. Once again, it's a psychological intervention and it replaces the anxiety response um, with a relaxation response. So systematic desensitization is a three-step process. And you must always, if they ask a question about systematic desensitization, you must mention the three steps. So they teach the individual the relaxation technique. They have the individual create a fear hierarchy, breaking down the phobic stimulus into a sequence from least feared to most feared. Um, and you gradually work upwards through the hierarchy, pairing the relaxation technique with the feared stimulus. Now, I did do a video specifically on this and I've given more examples. So you may wanna go to that video and have a look. Uh, social interventions, psychoeducation for uh, families and supporters, essentially they're teaching the family and the individual about the mental disorder, about the phobia, and uh, it increases their understanding of the disorder and helps them to cope with it. It also includes information such as why it occurs, um, what's the impact, how it impact, impacts their life, how it could possibly be treated. Um, and when it comes to families, they do also teach them to challenge any unrealistic and anxious thoughts. So a lot of people with phobias, they have their imaginations go crazy about um, their phobic stimulus. So what they do instead is have family members go, all right, just stop. I want you to tell me what you're thinking right now. And then they challenge it. The spider is not going to hunt you down and kill you. The dog is not going to um, going to attack you. It's behind a six foot fence. It's just not going to happen, right? So they're encouraged to actually challenge the individual's thoughts and anxieties. They also get taught not to encourage avoidance behaviors, right? So what they tend to do as um, let's say, for example, you have a family member who's afraid of dogs. Every time a dog comes in to the room or into the house or uh, into the yard or even anywhere near them, the family members tend to protect them. And because they're protecting them, they're actually encouraging avoidance behaviours because the person's not confronting the fear. So in psychoeducation, what actually happens is the family is taught, don't do that anymore. Let them face it on their own. They're not going to be able to get over the phobia if you do not help them to do so by letting them face it themselves. All right, so pretty much this is a breakdown of the factors that lead to a disorder and these are the interventions for them. This is might be a new um, diagram for you, so you may want to put this into your notes. All right, so with uh, regards to phobias, create a summary sheet. I cannot explain how many times I've given you these. Hopefully you have looked at them. Make sure you are able to know the different factors for specific phobias and mental health disorders. They're gonna be very easy to get confused. Have two separate areas of knowledge. Do not 
put the mental health stuff with the phobia stuff. Don't do it. It'll just get confusing. CBT is quite complicated. Practice writing out three or four sentence answer that summarise it succinctly. Phobias are caused and created, so precipitated, by classical conditioning and maintained and perpetuated by operant conditioning. Like I said, that one comes up a lot. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask.